Hello, I'm Daniel Benjamin, and I'm the president of the American Academy in Berlin, and I'm delighted to welcome you to uh, this semester's Bertolt Leibinger lecture entitled Displacement in the Horn of Africa, Racialization, Migration, and the United Nations. Uh, the lecture will be delivered by uh, our spring 2021 Bertolt Leibinger fellow, Natalie Poitz. And um, by way of explaining the fellowship, Bertolt Leibinger was uh, one of the great figures on the board of trustees of the American Academy from very early it's in, in its existence. Uh, the fellowship was uh, established in 2006 and it uh, is supported annually by the Bertolt Leibinger Stiftung, which is based in the German state, the German land of Baden-Württemberg. Uh, past recipients of the fellowship include um, uh, architecture historian Beatrice Colomina and sociologist Nancy Foner and literary critic James Wood, as well as many others. Uh, I'm delighted to say that um, uh, Natalie is at the Academy. Um, and in fact, a sharp-eyed viewer might come to the conclusion that both Natalie and I are in the Academy library. One of us is not. I will leave it to you to guess which one. But um, uh, uh, we're delighted that Natalie is here. We already have seven uh, seven fellows in residence, and we're expecting three more. So we have basically a full house this term, which is a nice contrast with last term. And um, uh, unfortunately, we're still coming to you by Zoom, which uh, is not our preferred mode, but at least we get to uh, broadcast to uh, people all over the world, which is not what we've done before, but something that we'll certainly want to do uh, once the pandemic is over. Um, let me just uh, say, I, uh, my job in all this is not to um, actually do the introduction myself. I get to introduce the introducer. And um, it, I'm delighted to uh, say that that, uh, that that role will be played by uh, Marina de, de Recht, uh, who is the Assistant Professor of Social and Cultural Anthropology at uh, the Free University of Amsterdam. She is joining us from Amsterdam uh, and she will uh, be in discussion with Natalie and will also moderate the Q&A session. Uh, Marina de Recht is a scholar who specializes in gender, labor and migration between Yemen and the Horn of Africa. Um, she knows the region intimately having spent uh, six years as a development worker in Yemen before she uh, undertook her PhD uh, in Amsterdam. Her dissertation was entitled Pioneers or Pawn, Women, Women Health Workers and the Politics of Development in Yemen. And it was inspired by her experiences in Yemen and published by Syracuse University Press in 2007. In her postdoctoral research, she studied migrant domestic workers in Yemen, in particular those coming from Ethiopia. Uh, Marina also did research on uh, adolescent migrant girls in Ethiopia and recently has finished a project on early marriages among Syrian women in Jordan. Marina, I'm really pleased you could join us tonight. And with that, I will turn it over to you with just one quick uh, uh, guide to uh, our viewers. Um, you can start um, sending in your questions now. If you have a raise your hand function, ignore it. Uh, it won't do you any good. Please do use the Q&A function uh, uh, on the bottom of your screen and uh, Marina will uh, get to as many of the questions uh, as she can. And so with that, Marina, thanks again for being here and over to you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. And it's really a great honor to be uh, asked to be a moderator and also to introduce uh, Nathalie. Uh, I think the topic of today is very, uh, yeah, very important and very topical, uh, also in view of the events, well, that recently, uh, yeah, took place in, in, in Yemen, but Natalie will also say something about it. Natalie is one of the most knowledgeable experts in the field, and we have been following each other's work uh, for a long time. I first met uh, Natalie in the summer of 2003 when I had just finished my PhD and I had started a postdoc uh, about migrant domestic workers in Yemen. And indeed, uh, most of them were of Ethiopian and of Somali descent. 
I don't remember exactly how we met, but most probably someone must have mentioned uh, Natalie's name to me as she was working on Somali refugees in Yemen at the time. So while there is already a limited number of scholars working on Yemen, the people that are working on migrants and refugees in Yemen, and in particular those coming from the Horn of Africa, are even more rare. So while nowadays many scholars are interested in refugees and as a result of the so-called refugee crisis, and refugee issues are very political and, and dominating uh, social and political discourses. Natalie was already interested in refugees back in the early 2000s. So when I met her, uh, in 2003, she had recently taken a boat, or she told me that she had taken a boat from the town of Mocha on the Red Sea coast of Yemen to Berbera, which is a small town on the coast of Somaliland. Uh, in two, that was in 2000, and, and she wanted to undertake that journey to learn more about the journeys that refugees take crossing the Red Sea. Um, well, we immediately struck up a friendship and when she decided to do uh, research on Socotra, that's Yemen's, uh, well, the, an, an, a big island in the, in the Indian Ocean archipelago of Yemen, I visited her for a few days. And I still remember that because Socotra is an unbelievably beautiful island and it's not easy to get there. Uh, but I really wanted to visit her during that, the, the time she was doing uh, research there. And uh, she showed me parts of the island. I also remember that. But I also remember that she was simultaneously working on a response to a debate about an article she had written about Somali refugees and US deportation policies in current anthropology. She was living in a very tiny stone house in the capital uh, uh, Hadibu. And well, internet was there, but I don't know if there was internet in Natalie's house, but I was really impressed that she was doing kind of high scholarly work in, in, in that uh, field site. So this work on deportation led to the volume, the deportation regime. I think quite some people will know about that. It was co-edited with uh, Nicolas de Genova and published by uh, Duke University Press in 2010. And it became one of the yeah, key publications on this deportation and it won uh, the bronze award from the association of borderland studies in 2011. all in all natalie lived for more than a year and a half on socotra and she went back to the island many times her first book uh, islands of heritage conservation and transformation in yemen was based on her phd research uh, during this time, and it was published by Stanford University Press in 2018, and it also won a prize, uh, the Middle East Studies Prize of the Anthropological Association of North America. Uh, this book is about an environmental project in Socotra and helps us to understand the unification and fragmentation of Yemen from the perspective of people on the margins. Uh, of the state who use the international discourse of environmental heritage to mobilize interest for their own local linguistic and cultural heritage. Then she, after, then she moved to, um, she, she spent some years in the US and uh, then she moved to uh, New York University in Abu Dhabi where you are now working as an associate professor. And uh, well, happy to be back, I think, in the Middle East uh, and, and close to Yemen. Uh, Natalie embarked on a new research project, and this was building on her work uh, on mobility between Yemen and the Horn of Africa. Um, she set out to study Yemeni uh, refugees. Uh, the war or uh, yeah, the war had started uh, and had produced or had already led to, to, to refugees or people fleeing Yemen. And she made in total 10 fieldwork trips to Djibouti from Abu Dhabi. And twice, that was also very impressive, took a group of students with her to Djibouti and especially to Markezi camp where she will talk about, which is one of the UN uh, 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 refugee camps there. She also made an exhibition together with the photographer Nadi uh, Benchalal, uh, pictures of uh, pictures of re by, by refugees taken uh, from the camp. 
and that was exhibited in uh, Djibouti City and at uh, New York University in Abu Dhabi. In addition to that, Natalie took uh, also a few short trips to South Korea and Malta to study Yemeni refugees there. And uh, well, she's now working on her book project, uh, which is well entitled Gate of Tears, Migration and Impasse in Yemen and the Horn of Africa. Uh, the research is uh, supported by a number of fellowships from the Social Science Research Council, Institute of Advanced Studies in Princeton, American Council of Learned Societies, and the Bellagio Center of the Rockefeller Foundation, and now also by the American Academy in, Academy in uh, Berlin. Well, I cannot wait to finish, uh, to see uh, Natalie's uh, finished book. I know she's not a, as quick as a writer as I am, but I have to revise my work always many times. And Natalie takes a bit longer, but I, her work is always uh, yeah, extremely uh, 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 yeah, impressive. And I'm very much delighted that I could introduce you and now I will stop talking. I think we give, uh, we decided to give Natalie 35 minutes uh, and then uh, there will be the Q and A uh, which I will moderate and there will also hopefully be some discussion between Natalie and me uh, as yeah, we have a lot of yeah, topics uh, in common. So Natalie, uh, the floor is yours and uh, good luck. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Daniel Benjamin, for this um, pleasant, uh, wonderful opportunity to be here in the same room with you. Uh, with uh, Marine Direct, thank you for this wonderful, uh, warm uh, welcome. We certainly have known each other for a long time, and it's really a pleasure to, to talk with you here after 20 years after meeting as graduate students. Uh, I also want to thank uh, the American Academy in Berlin. There are so many uh, people here doing so much to make our stay pleasant and productive during this really in interesting and challenging time that I'm actually not gonna name everyone here for fear of forgetting somebody, uh, but it is truly uh, an immense privilege to be here. It's also really a privilege to, to get to know the other fellows here whose work is incredibly inspiring. Uh, there is one uh, uh, person or a group of people actually that I would like to thank in, in, in name tonight, and that is the Familie Strohmeyer who were my host family about 30 years ago. And they welcomed me into their home and they taught me German and they taught me to love Germany. And they've been my family ever since. Thank you very much. This opportunity, I don't think actually this opportunity, but even my becoming an anthropologist and deciding that I could do things like go and live on small islands, all of that I owe to you. Thank you. Okay, so I'm delighted. I tell this project about Yemeni refugees and Ethiopian migrants in the Horn of Africa, how they share trajectories, traverse these categories, and disrupt or reinforce social hierarchies as they pursue a better life through or within in the confines of a fitful mobility. What I will focus on this evening is the current situation of Yemeni refugees in Djibouti, the site of the world's only camp for refugees fleeing Yemen's six-year war. In doing so, I hope to highlight the inequalities and intersections between refugees and migrants in this region, as well as to point to some of the adverse effects and implications of the UN's Global Compact on Refugees. Let me start by saying that this has not been a good week for news from the region. Uh, last Wednesday, Smugglers ferrying African migrants from Djibouti across the Red Sea to Yemen threw at least 80 passengers overboard. This happened shortly after their nighttime departure when the smugglers began shouting that the boat which they, they had packed with 200 men, women, and children was overloaded. At least 20 people drowned, and survivors are being treated at a migrant reception center run by the International Organization for Migration, IOM, near the small port of Obok in northern Djibouti. Tragedies such as this are disturbingly common. Last October, in two separate incidents, Ethiopian and Somali migrants drowned when smugglers hitting them with iron bars forced them overboard, also near the coast of Djibouti. What distinguishes these October drownings is that the African migrants were returning from Yemen to Djibouti, where they would have sought repatriation through the IOM center. They were on their way home. 
Then last Saturday, a Houthi-run detention center housing stranded migrants in Sana'a, the capital of Yemen, caught fire, possibly due to an airstrike damaging buildings nearby. More than 170 people were injured and around 30 migrants are feared dead. And two days ago, the head of the World Food Program returning from a visit to Yemen reported that famine-like conditions are rapidly increasing. Within this year, 16 million Yemenis, that's more than half of the population, are expected to go hungry. 50,000 people are already suffering from famine-like conditions, and another 5 million Yemenis may starve to death. So this actually um, is the front page of today's international CNN website. But in the next 30 minutes or so, I'm gonna focus instead on migrant and refugee encounters in Obok, Djibouti, the site where I've been conducting field work between 2016 and 2020. A small port town located at the base of Bab al Mendeb, separating the Red Sea from the Gulf of Aden, Obok runs even now on fresh produce, commercial foods, and fuel imported from Yemen. It is also a major gateway for Ethiopians traveling to Yemen and onward to Saudi Arabia, where they hope to find work. As they wait to embark on these dangerous crossings, as IOM has branded a migration awareness campaign, most of the migrants congregate in Fontahero, an oasis north of Obok town, where internally displaced Djiboutians also live in impoverished conditions. Those who have decided to return to their country find shelter at the IOM center, whether because they were deported from Saudi Arabia back to Yemen and are seeking to return home, because they made it only as far as Yemen, but were captured by Houthi forces and held in squalid detention centers where many were beaten, raped, and forced to pay ransom, or because they were abandoned in the Djiboutian desert by their smugglers. This center has the capacity to host 250 migrants awaiting repatriation to their country. At various times, however, it has struggled to house more than twice that number of returning migrants, mostly Oromo and Amhara from Ethiopia. For each group bus back to Addis Ababa, another group is often waiting and sleeping outside. Some never even make it this far. In June 2018, tens of Ethiopians died of cholera, collapsing just shy of the center. And the center is located across the street from the Markazi camp for refugees from Yemen. In fact, it was refugees in the camp who had shown me photographs of the deceased migrants, which they had taken. Notably, the refugees from Yemen and the migrants to Yemen are both forced by their life circumstances into crossing the same sea, and in some cases, the same land routes. Moreover, many of the refugees in the camp were also born in Ethiopia, Somalia, or Eritrea, and had migrated to Yemen and even Saudi Arabia before. Yet the legal distinction between refugees and migrants, and in this context, the racialized distinction between so-called Arabs and Africans is embodied ever so starkly by the fact that it is the African migrants who are paid a pittance by the Djibouti Refugee Authority to remove the camp's garbage. Camp refugees know that when an important delegation is on its way, uh, they, they know it's important by the number of Oromo who are brought in for cleaning. Ever hopeful that a visiting ambassador will result in their third country resettlement, the Yemeni refugees read the number of Ethiopian passersby brought into the camp as a direct indication of their own prospects for moving out. And almost daily, young Ethiopians enter the camp through the hole in the fence to rifle through its overflowing garbage searching for food. Several of the camp women have become accustomed to bundling up their families' leftovers for them. The Yemeni's relative privilege as both Arabs and refugees who receive aid from several Gulf-based humanitarian organizations is thus abundantly clear to them as they interact with the African migrants begging for scraps. In this photograph, what you see here is a, a man from Yemen, a refugee from Yemen who's driving the tuk-tuk who is passing uh, presumably Ethiopian migrants who are going to the port. Let me say a little bit about these photographs. Um, I, I wanna to talk tonight about why this should concern us and why I focus on this particular site of so-called mixed migration encounters. And I'll be looking at this through three lenses. Now, as I talk, I'll be showing several photographs taken by nine individuals living in Markazi in 2017. I include these, all of which were vetted by the photographers as a small but necessary reminder that each of my interlocutors brings their own point of view. Normally I credit the photographers by name, 
but because this talk is being recorded, I've chosen to present only their initials. And I also wanna say that moving forward, none of the pictures correspond with their subjects. And I've also changed some identifying details of people's stories. So one reason for drawing your attention to migratory movements across the Red Sea, the Eastern route from the Horn of Africa to the Arabian Peninsula is because in the two years before the pandemic, they actually exceeded the numbers of persons crossing the Mediterranean to reach Europe. And yet they were not given anywhere the near the same amount of media coverage, nor were they conceived as a crisis. So just in 2019, the year before the pandemic, which of course changed a lot of things, 138,000 migrants were counted as having entered Yemen from just two nations, Djibouti and Somalia, Somaliland, and 49,000 arrived just from Obuk. We can compare that to Mediterranean, where in 2019, there were 128,000 migrant arrivals, so a little bit fewer, entering into six different nations. Now, you'll see also that this number has decreased over the past five years, and especially in 2020, also due to the pandemic. We see the same decrease going into, uh, into Yemen, uh, uh, although numbers are now picking up again. And I mean, we can talk about this during the Q&A. So, Another reason to, to look at the situation, besides the fact that it is one of the busiest sea routes for migration, is that Djibouti was one of 15 countries worldwide to pilot the comprehensive refugee response framework first laid out by the New York Declaration for Refugees and Migrants in 2016. The framework was designed to enhance self-refugee self-reliance through improved access to education, healthcare, legal assistance, and employment. It also set the path for the adoption of the Global Compact on Refugees by the UN in 2018. Called a New Deal for Refugees, the compact aims to provide greater support for refugees and the host countries receiving them by helping to integrate refugees within national systems. To aid host communities, UNHCR would stop providing parallel services to refugees and would instead support government services directly. Third, a third reason to look at this site is that as a crossroads for migration to and from the Horn of Africa and the Arabian Peninsula, Djibouti is a productive site for problematizing the various categories commonly applied to moving populations who disrupt what Lisa Malky long ago called the national order of things. On the face of it, the encounters between those registered as refugees and those labeled as migrants in Obok suggest a stark distinction between the African migrants who go through the landscape with limited aid and the Arab refugees who feel incarcerated by the very institutions working to protect them. An embodied contrast between the politics of abandonment and the politics of captivity. Anthropologists Kevin O'Neill and Jatin Dua argue that the discipline's current focus on social abandonment overlooks the ways in which multitudes of people are captured, imprisoned, and contained. Thus, for example, for those drawing on Giorgio Agamben, refugee camps are often theorized as sites of exception and abandonment. By contrast, O'Neill and Dua argue, an analytic of captivity recasts camps as places of confinement in which national governments, international organizations, and humanitarian donors act as captors of persons seeking escape. However, this very distinction I just drew between the seemingly abandoned migrants and captured refugees has permeated the camp itself, a camp that is increasingly bifurcated by two competing humanitarian organizations and two competing regimes, the UNHCR and Saudi aid, local integration and a new form of parallel system. This may then more aptly be considered a tale of two camps, if you will. And more broadly, it suggests that instead of describing people moving between zones of abandonment and captivity, we must pay attention to how individuals inhabit states of abandonment and captivity at once, while also experiencing forms of regional mobility within increasing global immobility. Let me now take each of these points and flesh them out empirically, beginning with first a biographical focus on how for many of the camp's inhabitants, their life stories are shaped less by their current refugee status than they are by their family's histories of migration. Then I'll move to a structural lens to discuss the camp's humanitarian architecture and the impacts of the country's new refugee laws before finally zooming back out through a conceptual or theoretical lens, abandonment and captivity, mobility and immobility to consider the ramifications of this UN New Deal. The ongoing war in Yemen has resulted in one of the greatest humanitarian crises of our time. 
In addition to having lived through six years of armed conflict, millions of Yemenis have been suffering from hunger and malnutrition, the world's worst cholera outbreak, and critical shortages of medicines, fuel, and water. And this was before the pandemic began. Four million Yemenis, more than 10% of the country's population, have been and are internally displaced. And more than 350,000 individuals have sought refuge in neighboring countries. Given the duration and scale of this crisis, we might ask why haven't more people fled the country? Some reasons we can point to include the closure of Yemen's geopolitical borders and airspace, the mobility restrictions, financial costs, and physical hazards of traveling through Yemen and across the sea, and the reluctance of many Yemenis to leave their homeland. Whereas several scholars, including Marine Drecht, Oliver Blakewell, Caitlin Sturridge, have been researching the factors driving the growth in migration from the Horn to Yemen despite the war, my research was initially motivated by trying to understand the factors that drove Yemenis to seek refuge in the Horn, even as migrants and refugees from the Horn continue to seek passage through Yemen. Now, while the acute reason for this particular refugee movement is, of course, the war, and indeed entire coastal villages cross the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden to flee aerial bombardments and conscriptions by the Houthis, a secondary but significant driver of many Yemen's current transnational displacement is their multi-generational histories of Red Sea migrations and their subsequent experiences of alienation and racism in both Yemen and in Yemen. Uh, the Horn, sorry. This history does not simply complicate their experience of refuge. It has deep implications for the value that they attribute to their hard-won refugee status and for the UN's push for their local integration, a seemingly beneficial program which the majority of refugees I have interviewed reject. Yemen has a long history of producing diasporas. As early as the 16th century, Yemeni seamen, merchants, and religious leaders migrated around the Indian Ocean Basin from the Horn of Africa to the Malay Archipelago. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, Yemenis established communities around and across the Atlantic, employed as steel workers in the British Midlands and as automobile workers in the US Midwest. And in the 1970s, a large portion of the male labor force in both North and South Yemen at the time had migrated to the boom cities of the Arab Gulf. The first notable reversal of these waves of migration from Yemen occurred also in the 1970s when Yemeni migrants began returning from East Africa due to nationalization policies and rising anti-Arab sentiment there. The second significant return migration occurred in 1990-91 when around 1 million Yemeni migrants were effectively expelled from Saudi Arabia and other Gulf countries as a result of Yemen's stance during the 1990 Gulf War. This influx of largely unskilled return migrants cost Yemen its remittances, while also resulting in a 30% increase in Yemen's labor force and high unemployment. It was during this critical period that the newly unified Yemen began hosting thousands of Somali and Iraqi refugees. Yemen is the only country in the Arabian Peninsula that is signatory to the 1951 Refugee Convention and its 67 Protocol. As such, it generously accepted Somali refugees on a prima facie basis. In 2000, Yemen was even one of the world's top 15 host countries in terms of the number of refugees it hosted per capita GDP. But with few exceptions, Yemen had not produced visible outflows of refugees. Thus, while many Yemenis had conceived of themselves as or themselves or their compatriots as migrants, none of my interlocutors had ever imagined themselves becoming refugees. This changed in April 2015, when the regionalization of the war led to the first significant outflow of refugees from Yemen. By April 2017, Djibouti had registered more than 37,000 arrivals from Yemen, nearly 20,000 Yemeni nationals. Traveling via dows and motorboats during the closure of Yemen's airspace, most fled to Djibouti to access foreign embassies to procure visas to fly elsewhere. Those who stayed in Djibouti did so because they had family there, because they had no means for onward travel, or they could not obtain visas. Some even had actually won the visa lottery from the United States and were told to go to Djibouti because the US Embassy in Yemen had closed. So they spent a lot of money gathering their family and, and um, whatever they had to travel to Djibouti during these very difficult circumstances, only then to have the Trump administration uh, install and state the, the so-called Muslim ban that prevented Yemenis from entering the US. Others went to Djibouti and stayed precisely because they hoped that their newfound refugee status would open the door to their third country resettlement. 
By January 2020, the last time I was there because of the pandemic, there were nearly 7,000 Yemeni refugees divided between Djibouti city and Obok. Uh, you see those on the kind of more to the, uh, to the east. Uh, the bottom two camps are inhabited primarily, uh, the circles are, those are areas of camps inhabited primarily from, by refugees from Somalia, Ethiopia, and Eritrea. Several Yemenis have also opened up shops in Obuk. Uh, this is the blue circle to the very top of the map, but most of the refugees in the region live in the camp five kilometers west of the town. So due to its proximity to Yemen, many of the refugees in Obuk continued to travel back and forth to their coastal villages for commerce, weddings, and even medical treatments. Indeed, the majority of the camp's current residents originate from Yemen's coastal region, which has been hit numerous times by airstrikes, and from fishing villages like Wahaja, where more than 40 civilians were killed by the coalition's aerial bombardment of a wedding party in 2015. A minority come from Yemen's urban centers, Taiz, Aden, and Sana'a, which they fled when Houthi forces fired into their neighborhoods or tried to conscript their sons. Several of the camp's residents had been among the labor migrants expelled from Saudi Arabia following the 1990 Gulf War. Others had been refugees in Yemen. These include Somali and Eritrean families who insisted on remaining in what they called the Arab camp, Markazi, instead of being moved to Djibouti's two older and overpopulated camps that I pointed to before. However, a focus on the residents' national origins or even on Yemen's north-south divide obscures the tensions that cut across regions, growing rifts between the urban and rural populations, the educated and the undereducated, and Yemen's rigid social classes, which continue to marginalize people with darker skin and or African heritage. Akin to a caste system, what were once called servants are now called the Muhammadin, the marginalized ones. This national focus on geographies also obscures the histories of transnational migrations that transect the Red Sea region, as borne out by the large number of refugees who are considered Mawalid or biracial, that is having uh, Yemeni fathers and African mothers. I have time for one example. Ibrahim was born outside of Dira Dawa, a city in Eastern Ethiopia, to a Yemeni father who had migrated there from Northern Yemen and to an Oromo mother from the region. Ibrahim grew up to own a garage that was robbed and burned down in the late 1990s by Oromo looters who were telling the Arabs to leave. Scared for his life, Ibrahim moved to Sana'a, Yemen, where he eventually married Maryam, a woman who had also been born in Dira Dawa to a Yemeni father and to a mother who was half Yemeni, half Oromo. At different times, both Ibrahim and Maryam paid smugglers to help them enter Saudi Arabia, where they tried to find work. By the mid 2010s, they were doing quite well. They had four sons and they owned their house in Sana'a. But they also experienced a lot of discrimination in Yemen, now on account of being African or Mawalit, biracial. For instance, while driving his own taxi, Ibrahim was often pulled over and fined for what we would in the US would say driving while black. When the war began, the military base near their house was a frequent target of coalition strikes. Ibrahim could no longer afford to buy the fuel needed to drive his taxi. So they secured visas to Ethiopia, despite having been born there, they were Yemeni citizens as were their fathers. And two days before their scheduled flight, the Sana'a airport was bombed. So the family traveled overhand, overland to the coast and crossed the sea to Djibouti. Their passports were withheld upon their arrival. And by the time the passports were returned, their Ethiopian visas had expired. This family ended up living in the Markazi camp where Ibrahim set up a small grocery shop. There, Ethiopian migrants en route to Yemen would congregate at the shop, spending the cash they had earned cleaning the camp to buy biscuits or Coke. Ibrahim often warned them of the dangers ahead, he told me, but they could not be persuaded to abandon their journey. They had spent too much money already. The photograph you see here is taken by one of the photographers in the camp. It shows, it's a little bit difficult to see here, but it shows a museum that he has set up outside his tent and there's different installations. That's why you see dolls heads on the ground. And it's a little bit macabre, but he's trying to depict the war scenes in Yemen. Over the years, Miriam became increasingly frustrated with the daily indignities of camp life. She rented a house in Obok during the hot summer months and even opened a new store there, but was repeatedly harassed by the local police. Even in the camp, Ibrahim told me, some of the refugees refused to buy from him because he was considered not really Yemeni. 
By August 2017, Miriam was so fed up that she paid a Djiboutian man to smuggle her and her three youngest sons into Ethiopia against the tide of Oromo migrants being smuggled through Ethiopia on their way to Yemen. There in Addis, she registered herself and her children as Yemeni refugees in Ethiopia, despite having been born in Ethiopia herself. She did this so she could collect the monthly allowances given to refugee families there and to improve her odds for third country resettlement. In February 2018, Miriam returned to the camp along with an Ethiopian family member who was planning to migrate to Saudi Arabia via Yemen. Four months later, frustrated again, Miriam took two of her sons and the Ethiopian woman back to Yemen. There she cared for her ailing mother, but also struggled due to the limited food, health care, and security. A neighbor, for instance, came and told her that she'd been blessed with four sons. Why not give up one to become a martyr? Under pressure, her eldest son actually considered joining the Houthis, but after one of his friends died and was not buried by the Houthis on account of him being Habashi, a derogatory term for Ethiopian, Ethiopian, Miriam's son realized that even if he died fighting for Yemen, as he put it, he would never be valued as Yemen. As for Ibrahim, he refused to return to Yemen where he saw no future for his children. He also refused to return to Ethiopia, despite his Oromo mother still living there, because of the losses he had suffered there and his fear that his sons would likewise be ostracized as Arab. As determined as were the Ethiopian migrants to complete their journey, so was Ibrahim determined on resettlement in a third country. I will get out of this place, he told everyone he knew. In short, Ibrahim's family history illustrates how the Yemeni's migrations in the early 1900s are playing out a century later in the lives of thousands of individuals fleeing one conflict after another. Markazi, which means center in Arabic, is a center of such mixed migration stories. Yemeni men who migrated to East Africa to escape desperate conditions at home, where they married local women, whose Yemeni African children returned to Yemen to flee conflict or poverty in the Horn of Africa, and now their children, having suffered discrimination in Yemen, are finding their way back to the Horn, only to feel more immobilized than ever, as their own children, the fourth generation, are becoming refugees in multiple countries. That is to say, for these Mawaladin families, it was their migratory pasts that made their flight imaginable, but also, in their view, imperative. However, the camp's geographic, national, and racial diversity notwithstanding, where its residents originated from in Yemen does correlate in large part, but not exclusively, with where they hope to end up. While the majority of the fishing families continue to assert that they hope to return to Yemen, and many have, despite the rising food costs and continued insecurities there, more than a third of the 100 households I interviewed in 2017 were hoping for third country resettlement. For them, becoming a legitimate refugee, a child of the UN, as they say, was perceived as an escape from the rigid social hierarchy and inequalities within Yemen. As one man who describes himself as Mohammed Sheen, one of the marginalized ones put it, even if you asked me why I fled Yemen, and if I were to tell you I fled from the war, I'd be a liar. Even before the war began, I'd always hoped I would leave Yemen. But if I'd fled then, no country would have taken me as a refugee. The UN wouldn't have taken me. It would have said, there's no war in your country. And yet war was inevitable. In Yemen, we were suffering. I was like a refugee in Yemen, but without international recognition, a virtual refugee. Now I am a real refugee. When the refugees began arriving in Djibouti in April 2015, the government prepared for a much larger influx. What officials and the refugees were less prepared for were the scorching desert winds that quickly scoured their tents to shreds. Many refugees returned to Yemen that first summer. Others, like Miriam, depleted their savings to rent rooms in the nearby town. A headcount conducted by UNHCR in September found only 581 refugees in Markazi. Still, Gulf-based charities rushed to their aid. Bahrain's Royal Charity Organization donated colorful Sahara tents to replace the destroyed standard issue UNHCR tents. And the Qatari Red Crescent donated 300 refugee housing units designed by the IKEA Foundation. Although these better shelter units have won awards for their innovative design, their polypropylene siding makes them oppressively hot in Djibouti's desert climate. So many families use these caravans, as they call them, not for shelter, but for kitchens, for storage, and even in one case, as a chicken coop. 
In addition, the Marcosi refugees received relatively copious amounts of charitable aid and private donations, especially in contrast to the African refugees languishing in Djibouti's Ali Adda and Holho camps for the Somali and Eritrean and Ethiopian refugees. It's a five-star camp, a UN employee told me after describing Marcosi's outsized funding. And what you see here is a merchant, actually a Yemeni merchant from Djibouti city donated bottled, wa bottled water to the camp, which seems perhaps quite refreshing, but it was enough to give everybody water for one day when normally they drank out of a well. So people were kind of joking that I could have this special tea for that day alone. The camp's residents disagree that it is a five-star camp. Although the Marcosi residents are not hurting for living space, those who cannot return to Yemen or are not used to the climate describe feeling imprisoned by the camp's remote location and harsh environment. It was like we were chickens in a microwave, a woman said, describing the summer months in her caravan. The sense of oppression is compounded for many by their de facto internment in Obok, in a country they experience is even less developed than Yemen. Many said they had fled the war only to regress. As one man put it, there are good things here in Obok, like security, we can sleep at night, but we've gone backwards. The Syrians ended up in a better place, in Turkey. Describing Obok as a Stone Age town, the refugees are well aware of the foreign aid and employment that their presence has conjured. We're developing the people of Obok, his friend told me. They're the Bedouin. They're the ones benefiting. We're like a football tossed between Yemen, Djibouti, and Saudi Arabia. As part of its mandate, the UNHCR promotes three durable solutions for refugee protection, voluntary repatriation, local integration, and third country resettlement. Refugees in the camp debate these options as if they're choices that they actually can choose between. Six years into the war, however, neither the repatriation nor resettlement of Yemen's refugees is viable. The conflict continues and few third countries are accepting refugees from Yemen. This leaves the UN's renewed focus on local integration as the only conceivable solution. To this end, the government of Djibouti has taken progressive steps towards integrating its refugees. As I mentioned earlier, Djibouti is a framework pilot country. It also hosts more than 29,000 refugees and asylum seekers, despite its own poverty and high unemployment. In January 2017, Djibouti's president promulgated new laws aiming to ease the refugees' access to education, healthcare, employment, and even eventual naturalization. In theory, these laws paved the way for the inclusion of refugees in the national health and education system, and the goal being to do with parallel services, that is UN services for refugees and government services for nationals. In practice, however, the implementation of the framework provisions restricts the refugees' access to good medical care and their ability to shape their children's education. For example, the camp lost the medical and educational services formerly provided by international NGOs and government services are virtually non-existent. When I last saw Ibrahim in June 2019, for example, he was struggling with his exorbitantly high debts because the medical staff who bought from his store on credit had not been paid their salaries for five months and couldn't repay him. Even were the framework to meet its lofty goals, the refugees I interviewed do not trust that they would ever be integrated in a region from which they, their parents, or their grandparents once fled. What many of these refugees seek is an escape from generations of alienation and displacement. It is for this reason that they cross the sea, yet again, to become UNHCR recognized refugees. Refugees who through the prospect of third country resettlement could leverage themselves out of this regional migratory circuit and into a more global one. Nevertheless, in December 2017, when these laws came into effect, they were celebrated by the UN, as was the government's announcement that the country's camps would henceforth be considered villages. This semantic shift was accompanied in Marcosi camp, now Marcosi village, by a structural transition from their temporary tents to more durable housing units. Funded by Saudi Arabia's King Salman Center for Humanitarian Aid and Relief, these air-conditioned container homes were presented as more suitable for refugees in this sweltering climate. Yet most of the residents of Marcosi disagreed. Even air-conditioned houses and a commitment to increase government services could not make up for the camp's barren location, the town's impoverishment, and the country's lack of economic and educational opportunities for refugees from Yemen. Moreover, for those who yearn to be resettled in Germany or Canada, these houses are nothing more than a gilded cage. 
Many feared that if they feared that if they were to move physically from their impermanent tents to these more durable containers, they would be moving jurisdictionally from the tent of UN international protection to the de facto prison of permanent displacement. This concern has been compounded by the visiting Yemeni minister's insistence that the Markazi residents were merely displaced, a renunciation of their refugee status seemingly echoed in the government's determination that the camp had become a village. And it was compounded even more when in October 2018, an earlier delegation from the Salman Foundation opened what they called the Saudi village in the midst of a UN camp. Given the timing of this delegation's arrival just weeks after the murder of the Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi, several refugees speculated that the Saudi government was simply trying to tarnish its image. Some hoped that the increasing pressure on the Saudis would shine a light on their own predicament and perhaps even open new doors to resettlement. At once cynical and hopeful, most of my interlocutors insisted that they would refuse the gift. Even if Saudis gave us a villa, I wouldn't move, a woman told me. But the sweltering summer sandstorms broke many people's resolve. Today, nearly all of the 300 housing units are occupied. The few households who do remain in their IKEA caravans describe themselves as steadfast. Some of these families refuse to move to the Saudi village for political reasons. As one man put it, the Saudis destroyed my house in Yemen and now they wanna give me a house here? All of these households are holding out for third country resettlement. It's insisting that they will never return to Yemen nor will they accept this integration in a Djiboutian desert. And so now within Markazi, there are in essence two camps, the Saudi village maintained by the Salman Center and the remnants of the UN camp maintained officially by the Djibouti government, but in actuality by no one. In the Saudi village, effectively captive refugees living in highly regulated barracks received electricity for four hours each morning and evening and received monthly food packages directly from the Salman Center. In the remnants of the UN camp, effectively abandoned refugees living among discarded debris no longer had any electricity or sanitation services. We don't know who is responsible for us, a person remaining in his tent told me. Moreover, whereas initially development of the Saudi village appeared to provide support for the UN's push for local integration, as opposed to repatriation or third country resettlement, its future is increasingly unclear. What seemed to be emerging, at least until the pandemic, is yet another parallel system. Rather than being integrated within national institutions or within the nearby town, the refugees living in the gated and air-conditioned Saudi village were becoming even more disconnected from the local environment and more dependent on Saudi assistance. If this holds true, then the politics of humanitarian competition at the regional level may well thwart the logics championed by the comprehensive refugee response framework. Meanwhile, tired of languishing in this de facto prison, many of the refugees return to Yemen. Others have decided that the only way forward is through undocumented migration. Five men I know flew to Khartoum where they paid smugglers to take them to Libya. After two years in transit, including imprisonment in Libya, they boarded a rubber dinghy to cross the Mediterranean and made it to Malta. Currently, they are seeking asylum, again as refugees, in a country in Northern Europe. Before Miriam returned to Yemen, she had also briefly considered traveling the Libya route. My whole life has been one of smuggling, she told me when I met her in Addis Ababa in June 2019, after she had paid a smuggler to return her and her sons from Yemen to Djibouti and again into Ethiopia, where she was now pursuing family reunification through a cousin in Canada. She'd given up on the formal mechanisms of the UN and was trying to take matters into her own hands. A month after I saw her, Ibrahim suffered a stroke. Miriam smuggled him into Ethiopia where they thought he would receive better medical care, but he died along the way. His once vibrant store, now a decrepit shack, died along with him. On its wall, someone had scribbled, a third country, O oh world. Now, unless Miriam finds another crack in the system, it is not inconceivable that Ibrahim's young sons, once refugees in Djibouti, now refugees in Ethiopia, will one day embark as migrants on the Eastern route to Saudi Arabia, perhaps even passing by the camp in which they once lived. And so with each passing month of the Yemen crisis, these putative distinctions between refugees and migrants, 
Between those stuck in Obuk because of the Saudi bombardment of their villages and those stuck in Obuk in hope of reaching Saudi Arabia. Between those who are captured by the international order of things and those who are abandoned by it. Between those who are metaphorically captive and those who are literally held for ransom. Between those who are racialized as Arab and those who are racialized as African. Between those crossing the Red Sea and those crossing the Mediterranean. These putative distinctions become increasingly indistinct. I began this talk evoking an image of two camps, a UNHCR camp for refugees from Yemen situated directly across the street from an IOM center for migrants heading to Yemen. Upon first encounter, there appears to be a stark distinction between the African migrants who traverse the desert landscape with little to no assistance and the Arab refugees who feel incarcerated by the international refugee regime. A closer look reveals a kind of mirroring of this distinction within Markazi itself a camp of refugees from Yemen who've been absorbed into and captured by the Saudi village and a camp of refugees from Yemen whose local integration, much less third country resettlement has been virtually abandoned. A second turn takes us down a hall of mirrors in which all the distinctions I just mentioned dissolve into one. Between those who are able to escape and those who are not. Between those who enjoy mobility and those who do not. If this is an unsatisfying ending, it is partially due to the fact that with few exceptions, there are no good endings here. Now living inside the Saudi village, inside a gated refugee camp in the northern province of Djibouti, the African Arab residents in Markazi feel more, both more abandoned and more incarcerated than ever. In this climate, the UN Global Compact for Refugees reads less like a global commitment than it does a form of Southern captivity and Northern abandonment. To the extent that there is a refugee crisis, it is that this new deal for refugees is just a new and more pernicious form of encampment. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Natalie. It was a very impressive talk. Uh, I'm really, I, I know the audience can see us, but we cannot see the audience. Uh, um, well, I'm, I'm almost sure that you are impressed as well. This is a very important topic uh, and that we really hear very little about. And uh, I think the analysis you have given is, uh, yeah, is something we really, really need uh, to hear. And, and it's so much more complicated. And I also very, very much, but I knew that already, the fact that you link it to this historical migration uh, between Yemen and, and, and the Horn, uh, which goes back uh, centuries. And, and, and of course, the link with racialization and uh, alienation. Anyway, I'm not going to pose questions. I, I decided we have about 10 minutes, a bit more than 10 minutes. So I see that there are already questions coming up in the question and answer. So raising your help uh, hand doesn't work. Just put your uh, uh, questions in the Q&A and I will read them. Uh, well, the first one is are lots of questions. <laughs> okay, I'm going to read it, uh, Natalie. Uh, thanks for this amazing talk. A few questions. How do you see the influx of humanitarian and development funds from Gulf countries to Djibouti and East Africa in general through the lens of the broader geopolitical dynamics in the region? Are there other interests at play beyond Saudi GCC front uh, fronting their humanitarianism? Do we know anything about how migrants going into Yemen in the hope of reaching Saudi Arabia fare? Well, uh, could you clarify, these are a lot, could you clarify a bit on the current presence of UNHCR, other UN actors in the country and their engagements? And also interesting parallel between steadfastness in the Palestinian context and that of the Yemenis rejecting Saudi aid. Uh, I think that is, uh, you, you don't need to answer them all. There's another question. There are more questions. There are lots of questions. Oh, so in fact, uh, pick one. Oh, do you want to, yeah, can you first answer uh, one? Yes, and, I will. And uh, please be brief because I like to give the, well, to read an, a few others too. I will. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I'll, just a few brief notes on each of those points. Uh, the... Um, there is, of course, a broader regional dynamic in terms of uh, kind of a, a, a 
race for uh, for relevance and influence in the horn uh, by the Gulf states. Uh, that's a whole other topic. Uh, I'll just say here that the refugees in the camp are very much aware of this, and they feel that, in fact, one of the reasons um, from their perspective, they are not allowed to leave the camp or not allowed to leave Djibouti as refugees um, being resettled because they think that uh, that Saudi Arabia uh, is preventing this because it would look Saudi Arabia look, make Saudi Arabia look bad. Um, more uh, concretely, uh, there was certainly a kind of a dynamic of competition when Qatar uh, donated the IKEA caravans and then Saudi Arabia came in with the uh, you know, each time it was the Bahrain donated the tents and then that got a little bit better and a little bit better. And, uh, you know, there could be a, many reasons for this, but what's important here is also how the refugees read this also as a form of comp direct competition. Uh, we do know about knowing about the migrants going to Yemen. Uh, how do they fare? Not very well at all. There's story after story of them being held in detention centers. Uh, Marina can speak to this too. It's, um, they are, uh, they, uh, I'll give one brief example. Actually, this relates to a question I see uh, later on about COVID. Uh, the migrants, the, the African migrants actually have been uh, stigmatized for carrying COVID into Yemen, presumably. And so um, they were, they were near the border of Saudi Arabia and were actually fired upon by Houthi forces who for ostensibly carrying COVID and then um, to get them to leave Yemen. And so they were being pushed across the border into Saudi Arabia and then were fired upon by Saudi Arabia as they were entering into the border. And they ended up being uh, stranded in the mountains between Saudi Ar and Arabia for weeks, if not months. Um, many of them have now been deported back to Ethiopia. So COVID has actually made the situation a lot worse uh, because they've become scapegoated uh, for this, um, this issue. Um, I'll, um, one, I'll just one last thing here. You, you talk about the interesting parallel about steadfastness in terms of the Palestinian context. I did uh, purposely uh, use that word in my talk, which, uh, which the Yemeni refugees use because it did really resonate with me in terms of the same way that Palestinians talk about being steadfast. Uh, so thank you. All right, thanks, Natalie. Um, another question. Uh, can we say that the global initiatives like comprehensive refugee framework and global compact are so far disconnected from the local context and real needs? I think so. I mean, the global, you know, there's there are other people who've written about this. Peter Nyers has a, a short article called um, uh, humanity, uh, the something about the global compact and the humanitarian hubris. I'm not, I don't remember exactly the title, uh, where he talks about one of the problems with the global compact on refugees and migrants is this idea that one can actually have orderly migration and that one can manage it from this, you know, uh, in terms of uh, kind of uh, the global north giving money to the global south to maintain the migrant populations there. The reason I went into such detail of the story of Ibrahim and Maryam is to show how messy this actually is and that even so-called refugees have been paying smugglers uh, one direction and another direction and that people are moving in and out of these categories all the time. Uh, you know, really what's, uh, Miriam's quite an amazing example because she keeps trying to take matters into her own hands and uh, instead of waiting as some people in the camp do for Canada to come and rescue them. I do wanna say that, uh, that Yemen, that you know, for all my critiques of this, of how this global compact plays out in in Djibouti, uh, where one of the main um, criticisms of the of the Yemeni refugees is that they really don't want to be integrated in Djibouti. They don't see this as any that you know advancement on their situation now. Um, that Djibouti has at least opened the door to refugees from Yemen, as Yemen did to refugees from Somalia and other countries, and so. It is, you know, the global South does host the majority of the world's refugees. They have, they do, they will. And the global North has to come up with more solutions than simply paying people to keep, paying these countries to keep refugees and migrants in their place. Uh, I think this is gonna be extremely important as we head into the next decades when we have ever more migrants uh, trying to cross borders due to climate change. And even when now we have the most people displaced in recorded history.
Thanks. Uh, more questions, long questions also. Well, also a short question about COVID. How has COVID impacted mobility uh, or impacted the situation? Is it used to limit mobility? So, yeah, I said briefly, I mean, a, a lot more Ethiopians have been deported from Saudi Arabia to Yemen and then kind of from Yemen back or they were deported directly from Saudi Arabia to Ethiopia. Uh, fewer Yemenis have been going back to uh, Yemen. Uh, the In the camp, there were no uh, uh, recorded or known cases of COVID actually in Obuk at all. Uh, so the people I know there are not concerned about this. Uh, there was a bit of reduction in aid for a while or in terms of people visiting the camp. And I'm, I'm guilty of this too. I haven't gone in a year. Uh, they, um, what's happened though is that uh, there were border closures. So a lot of the Ethiopians who had been sent back to Djibouti were then also stranded, couldn't get back into, into Ethiopia there because of that border closure. So they were stranded in, first stranded in Yemen, then stranded in Djibouti. Uh, people, uh, refugees I'm in contact with on WhatsApp tell me that there were more and more Ethiopian migrants who had um, kind of had been gathering in Obok. So it's not really a surprise uh, to read a week ago that the boat of people going to Yemen was overloaded. Uh, it's quite likely that many of them were Ethiopian migrants who had just come back from Yemen and got tired of just being stranded in that region and decided to try um, their luck again. Uh, so COVID certainly has made uh, mobility and migration just more complicated for everybody around. Uh, but I think the main impact here, and but we are now seeing numbers starting to increase again in terms of crossing the Red Sea. I do think the main impact here um, probably is the scapegoating that happens. Yeah, um, there's one comment uh, from somebody who, and I can agree with it, shame to the world, neighbors, Arab leaders, I mean, how, I mean, the situation is in Yemen is, of course, or, or Yemeni people are, uh, uh, well, what is it, marginalized and, and forgotten. Uh, uh, nothing to say to that. There are some other people that share their thoughts. There's one uh, question about your your statement of Southern captivity and Northern abandonment. Uh, somebody found that very fascinating and wondered whether you could speak a bit in this respect about strategies of deviance you may have encountered of your interlocutors, how they navigate these two regimes to their own purposes. Uh, that's a good question. I mean, there. I guess you could do it, frame it through deviance. Um, I don't know if that's a framing that I would use. I think that people are just trying to do what's best for their children and their families anywhere. And I mean, I, that's where I, I, I kind of just for the purpose of this talk, um, and it's not, you know, a, a term as such, but talked about someone just trying, trying to find cracks in the system. Uh, if I were, I, I, I only think about how, um, I mean, how we now with COVID, which, you know, try and do anything to keep our families safe and people are doing the same thing all over, right? I mean, there it's, so I don't know if I would use deviance as a, as a framing, uh, but I, that's something I probably want to give a little, little bit more thought. I just see it as people, um, you know, just tr desperate to have a better life for their children. Um, let me see. There's a long statement of somebody who's doing research uh, among Yemeni immigrant women in Djibouti city, but there's not a real question. So I think what I want to say to the audience also is that we will re read your questions later. We, we uh, what is it? Uh, say they will be saved and we can respond to them later. So we will do that. Um, I don't know, I'm also looking at the time. I'm afraid we're running out of time. So if there's one last question or otherwise I will pose the last question to, to Natalie. Why don't you go ahead, Marina? <laughs> yes, okay. Uh, well, I'm, uh, I, I, I recently, I know that you've also done research in Hodaida and I did, uh, I lived there for a long time. And uh, I recently got a picture that there's only 10% of the people still living in Hodaida on the Red Sea coast. And that those are most, yeah, probably people that have nowhere to go. So what could you, but maybe it's gonna take too much long time. Um, 
and these are will be, be people the people that move and you also explain how people still go back and forth to yemen so those people are still having the the means to to move uh, and can you say that there's still a group of of course a, a big group in yemen that is also of african descent or shares the same history but have no yeah nowhere to go let me just say quickly, and I can tie, uh, pull in a question that was that was posed by somebody else in here about uh, how people do benefit from inclusion or integration in Djibouti. Um, so there are people, of course, who uh, uh, who are doing better being in Djibouti than they are if they are in Yemen. Uh, those are people, who especially, who've had jobs and get a, a monthly salary working for an NGO or 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 the people in the camp who've opened up shops. Uh, and so, but you have a mix of this. You have some, you have people in the camp who are sending their salaries back to support their family in Yemen. And that's one of the reasons they stay in the camp. You also have people in the camp at times who are sending uh, uh, monetary support to help their family members in the refugee camp. So it, it's quite mixed and it goes uh, both ways. The inclusion, um, what Djibouti has done, which is really good, is that they have uh, made all schools open to Yemeni to, to refugees. They don't, you know, delimit this if you're not a citizen, uh, as well as healthcare. Uh, the the real problem is that it's um, that works for the people who are from the coastal areas of Yemen who anticipate going back at some point. Uh, and the, the, the concern, um, a lot of my interlocutors, is that because that's in place, that the world is not interested in those of the other ones who, who don't see a future for themselves, who are never coastal fishermen, who are from urban areas, who don't see a future in a desert. And this goes to one other person's question, which was asking whether I think the world has done enough to pay attention to Yemen. Uh, Yemen, many people have talked about this as the forgotten war. Every time Yemen gets a little bit of news coverage because it had the world's worst cholera outbreak in 2017, then it gets eclipsed by something else. Then it was on near famine in 2018, and that was narrowly averted. But then, uh, you know, and, and now there's a, uh, now it's actually heading into uh, very close to near famine as well. And the problem is that there's basically donor fatigue because of the coronavirus pandemic. So. Yemen has always gotten a short stick and um, uh, it's, you know, hopefully now with the new administration in the United States, uh, change in policies will actually help to improve the situation. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hand over the mic <laughs> to Daniel. Yeah, well, that was a, a deeply moving and troubling and fascinating talk. So I want to thank you, Natalie, and I want to thank uh, Marina, too, for uh, doing a terrific job. I, I, I will note that the uh, administration in Washington has already signaled, well, it's already uh, appointed a special envoy for Yemen. And uh, the news in the last few days is that there's going to be a special envoy for uh, the Horn of Africa as well. Um, I say that without wanting to raise very, very high expectations, because as Natalie and uh, Marina, as you both pointed out, the problems in the region are just staggering. Uh, they were staggering before there was a war in uh, uh, a civil war in uh, Yemen, um, and uh, they will remain staggering no matter what. But we can hope for some. Uh, we hope for some amelioration. Um, anyway, a terrific event. I just want to say, in closing, um, if you are to the audience, if you're interested in another talk. Uh, on the topic of migration um, exactly two months from now on May 11th at um, 7.30 Central European time, uh, another one of our fellows, uh, Hakim Abderazek, will uh, give a talk entitled The Refugee Crisis, Crossing, Cutting and Burning the Mediterranean Cemetery. Hakim is an associate professor of French and Francophone studies at the University of Minnesota and um, he will examine all the clandestine migrations uh, across the Mediterranean as they have been portrayed in French, Arabic, Spanish, and Italian uh, literature and cinema. Um, just to discuss very briefly uh, um, the other things that are up ahead um, at the Academy, um, 
I hope you will go to our website, uh, www.americanacademy.de and look at the upcoming events section. Uh, we have five more lectures just this month. Um, the next event is um, a hybrid event, hybrid not in the sense that there's gonna be a live audience or anything, but in the sense that there's a lecture and a panel. And um, that uh, is entitled Rethink, Reset, Recalibrate, U.S.-China relations from Donald Trump to Joe Biden. The speaker will be Elizabeth Economy, very distinguished uh, scholar of China at uh, the Council on Foreign Relations and the Hoover Institution. That'll be on March 16th. Uh, well, another event will be um, on March, uh, I'm sorry. Yes, that's March 16th. Uh, I don't want to confuse myself. Another one will be on the 18th. It's entitled Virgin Galactic and the Making of a Modern Astronaut. And that will be delivered by Nicholas Schmidl, who is a staff writer uh, for The New Yorker. So please do go to the website. Please do sign up for some of these talks. And thank you for joining us tonight uh, for what was a really fascinating and uh, very sobering uh, discussion. Um, I wish you all well. Bye-bye.